Saido Berahino here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this show. You're not going nowhere. If they don't give me 30 million or a higher bid, he's not going nowhere. And my mum's starting to cry. As I said to you, I spoke to one of your former teammates, Darren Fletcher. I said, Would you give me a couple of words on Saido? And I don't ask for positive or negative. He just They just give me this. I'm not going to lie to you. My time at Stoke was filled full of depression. Yeah, so the reason why I got sacked at Stoke is because of that robbery. So you got sacked because you got robbed? Yeah, 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 yeah. You already know the vibes, vibe. Looking in with the guys, guys. Even real and Joe, bro. I got you in the five, five. You know the vibes, you know the guys, you know the trio. You know it's the Yes, guys, welcome back. This is Vibe with Five. We are here, Joel, Steve, myself, and we've got a guest in the place today. Please introduce yourself. Who are you? Where you're from? You are the guy. The floor is yours. Hi, guys. Um, it's Saido Berahino here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this show. I'm ready, man. I'm ready. <laughs> we've been trying to get you for a couple of weeks now. Obviously, you're, you're, where are you now? Where are you playing? I'm in Belgium at the moment, so I'm on loan to a team called Charleroi. Um, we're trying to do a thing this season. We, we're struggling a bit, but yeah, I'm just here in Belgium, man. It's my second season in Belgium. It's been different, totally different from English football. So in terms of like, let's, let's just take it back and rewind. Like, And, and I looked at, when we, we spoke about unique uh, players who we could speak to, your name jumped out straight away. Just your pathway to where you've got to. Can you give us a little bit of insight into into yeah. how you where you came from to get to playing in the Premier League? So um, I was born in Burundi. Burundi is a small country in Central Africa. Uh, population is about ten to eleven million. So at the age of ten years old, um, I actually came over to England to join my mum and my oldest sister. Obviously, at the time, I had no intention of coming here to become a footballer. It's just a kid trying to uh, rejoin his family. Uh, my sister, as obviously my dad passed away at a very young age. So when I came into England, um, I think the first thing that got me uh, got me into the into the English culture really was football because I couldn't speak the language. Uh, I can only speak French and Swahili. So being at school, uh, being able to play with the other kids it got me closer to the culture and the people here so that allowed me to get uh, my little trial at a Sunday league club um, which I last lasted about six months then that became another one another trial to West Bromwich Albion which lasted six weeks and then I got signed man under 12 I signed for West Bromwich Albion not even having a clue who were the who they were at the time um, then yeah then I think my love of football just grew from there and it just went on and on. And so it was a it was crazy one. It was a crazy fast life, as I'll call it. So have, have you always been someone who's just naturally been able to score goals? Because I mean, everyone I've spoke to when I knew I was, we were getting you on the show, um, they all spoke about your, the way that your quality of finishing. Is that something you were kind of born with you feel or have you worked on that as a kid? No, I always had that. I don't know. I always had that eye for goal. I always stood right next to the goal, tried to get the goal, even if it was a little goal hanging goal. You know, I, you know, everybody used to play Wembley, so I always used to be the one lasting long and staying in there rounds after rounds. So when I went to West Brom, I remember the coach asking me, "Where do you want to play? What's your position?" I was just like goals. I just said goals straight away. So I didn't know about being a striker or a defender or a winger. I just said I score goals. So he stood me up front, um, and by the by the way, I couldn't speak English, you know. So it was very difficult six weeks for me. So I think my smile got me through a lot of things, and um, I managed to sign in under twelves. So you, you know, you know, you're um, just going back to that. Obviously, unfortunately, your father passed away. How big an effect did that have in you as a kid, and and how did you deal with that? Coming to a new country, not speaking the language, young children, what that can be like as well. How did you deal with that? Um, for me, it was difficult, especially now being older and realizing what 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 how is so important to have a father figure in your life. I think I missed that massively. 
certain situations will happen around me and I won't be aware of it. And my mom tried to guide me as much as she could. But we both know as men, you you need that father figure, somebody that you look up to, somebody that can actually guide you. And that was probably one of the weakest areas in my life because I just never had somebody to guide me and look after me. So I kind of learned after a mistake I've done and in the game that I was in, in the career that I was in, it cost me a lot. So not having a father figure was a massive thing for me. Did you follow football when you was back home in Burundi or was that something you just picked up when you moved over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The massive thing was obviously the African Cup, uh, the World Cup. So we used to watch, we never used to watch Premier League and stuff like that because we never had the channels. But when a major tournament was on, everyone was supporting either the Brazil, the France, you know, um, African Cup we used to support Senegal, Nigeria. So I grew up liking the likes of Etu, JJ Okocha, just watching them on telly. So that's what so, it was on. So I was doing some research in you and I realised that um, you did pretty all right in school. 10 GCSE certificates, is that correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yes. that tells me yeah. that uh, it seems like your family were pretty much on education still, because if you're playing for a pro club, but you still manage to do that, that's pretty pretty good right how were they when it came to it was it something they drilled or did it come naturally no my mom actually drilled on me onto this the the thing was my mom didn't want me to to not have any education course. all my older sisters got married at a pretty young age so she only had me to look after so me and my last sister follows 10 years gap so you can imagine they're all, all older than me it was just me and my mom at home and school was just one of the things that she understood better than football. She left the football side to West Brom and school was like any little trouble I get into, she comes to school, slap me in front of the teachers, pull my ears when I was in trouble. So I managed to get some A um, Bs and Cs in there. So yeah, I was happy with myself actually. Yeah, listen, I just want to talk about the football as well, man. I mean, the way you play football, I've played against you before and Again, I, I reached out to a few people that you'd ever played against and played with, with, and they all mentioned your, your your goal scoring. Like I said, is that is that something that you would have gone and worked on? Um, what was your 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 training regime in terms of your finishing? Because all kids want to be strikers; they want to finish. Give us a little bit of insight into what you see in terms of when the ball's in front of you, in front of goal. What you do in training to make sure that you're ready for a weekend and you're, and you're sharp. So one thing that I don't think he even knows about, Romelu Lukaku, right, got loaned out to West Bromwich Albion. I think he was 20 years old, fresh, my age. And he was the first player I saw take a ball of bags, get a young kid and go to another pitch and just do finishing, finishing repetition after the repetition. So I used to watch him and think, he's my age and he's obviously playing the Premier League same position but he's doing things that i've never saw before a professional footballer do so i was like wow that's unbelievable just the dedication the focus when he misses a target he's getting mad and stuff so i kind of took that from him and the following season i managed to break into the first team and i used to call the second coach every time let's do finishing keith down in his name was let's do some finishing keith let's do some finishing so i just had that in my head after training if i had a crap training session i knew that my finishing period will get me that little buzz that will go home happy about you know what I mean so I just used to do that every time finishing 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 and that season I became top scorer in, in at West Brom at West Brom with with nine goals so I was happy with myself and then yeah the big the big season came after did you have any any setbacks when you was a uh on your way into the uh, first team? Because a lot of young kids, they, they they look at that journey and think it's all just a, a bed of roses, this perfect scenario straight from the youth team into the first team. Brilliant. What was your road like while you was at West Brom? So I went on loan three times. Uh, my first one was on Northampton, which was really bad. We never won. I never won one game. I played 14 games, 14 defeats, but I managed to get six goals. And I remember one game I'll never forget against Hereford. I called Dan Ashworth and I begged him on the phone, please, Dan Ashworth, bring me back to West Brom. I'd rather play in reserve. We lost seven. Dan Ashworth is like, he's like the, he was, what was he? Was he the sporting he was director the at the time? sports director at West Brom. 
He's at Brighton yeah. now, isn't he? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. He worked at England as well. So I begged him, please take me back. I can't take this. We're losing every game. He's like, that's going to make you a man. Stay there. <laughs> then that same season in January, I managed to go to um, Brentford, League One that we're in. I went to Brentford. I scored four in eight, then got sent back for being in trouble. Um, my friends kept staying in the hotel and making noise. So the coach didn't like that and sent me back. Um, wow. And then... The following season, I went to Peter Bright in a championship and scored two in eight, two in ten, and I got injured. That's when I did my massive injury. I I, um, I fractured my patella, so they had to remove a little piece of my patella, and I was out for 10 to 11 months. So that was wow. the biggest challenge I had to face before I became a professional footballer for West Brom in the first team. You spoke about a little bit of trouble there you got into, yeah? Was 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 that the start of, of people maybe misunderstanding you? Um, being sent back from a club is obviously a big thing. And obviously it wasn't for outrightly your fault. But again, looking at clippings and doing research on you before you come in, you see there's stories about you um, not being great in the change room, etc. And and it's so different to what I've heard when I've spoken to people about you. Everyone I speak to I've only got positive things to say about you. So can you shed some light on why and, and, and those reasons? I think it, I was the perfect I was the perfect lad that the media built me up and literally did what they had to do to bring me back down. Um, any player that I've played with, I'm sure I was never one of the bad egg that they put me out to be in you know, in in the, in the change room, I had my personal life that was out of or uh, out of place at time, and I did some some stuff that wasn't nice. Uh, just got carried away as a young kid, but as a teammate, I don't think I went out my way to make life hard for the managers or the other team uh, teammates around me. So I was never a bad egg. I was just a kid that turned up on late late at times. Um, maybe didn't train 100% every time. But they always seen the passion of football in me. So I don't understand why the media did that. But I think the media really played a massive part in my life. Um, and that, that's one thing I could say. I don't know you know, you, know, you talked really. about maybe turning up late and sometimes you wasn't 100%. This is at a young age. Obviously, things have changed now and we'll move on to that in a while. But as a young lad... yeah. How did you allow yourself yeah. to be late, and and what was you what was going through your mind that you, sometimes you didn't put all the effort in? Was it because you were young and you thought I'm always going to be a player? I've got I've got a talent, so I'm always going to get a chance, or just misguided or didn't have that father figure maybe to guide you? Even I don't know. You tell us. I think one thing I could say was that attention seeking. It was an attention seeking thing where if I got dragged out at half time or I didn't start a game. I needed the manager to be in my ear or put his hand, put his uh, arm around me. So I would do silly things to grab his attention. I'll do silly things to grab the seniors' attention. Where the black side, come on, pull, come on, we need you, we need you to do this, so I can feel like I'm, I'm, I'm loved or something. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I think that probably comes with the father figure thing, not having somebody, a male figure around you, that even motivated you or pushed you. So I used my environment at football to give me that sort of love that I was missing at home. And I wow. had a lot of father figures at West Brom. So they're the people that kept me going and pushed me because they're the ones that I spend most of the time with. And my mother was just my mother. Like she was my backbone and everything. So football was another word for me that I kind of got these things that I needed. So I think attention was the biggest thing that I lacked growing up as a kid. Do, do you think you, you people misunderstood you then and didn't understand some of the reasons as to why you sometimes was out of sync with the other players in terms of your punk punctuality and, and stuff like that and didn't maybe under talk to you enough to get that understanding. And like, as a young player coming through now, would you sit there and go, actually, let me look, look a bit deeper into this kid and then try to understand why he might be doing things that aren't perfect? I think I had the best of both worlds. Like at West Bromwich, at West Brom, I had the best senior players around me. The, like who? Chris Brown, James Morrison. Chris Brown, James Morrison, Yusuf Malumbu, Anelka, Gareth McCauley, Jonas Olsen. They were amazing 
Ben Foster, they were great. Like they spoke to me every day. And of course, at the time I was the only youngest teenager in the team, really. It was just me and nobody else that was around my age. So they had this little brother that they used to look look after. And then when I moved to Stoke, it was a totally different world. It was like just getting picked out, getting thrown in a war zone, and then you have to look after yourself. And that's literally how it was. Everybody was there for themselves. You come in, you work, you do your thing, you go home. There wasn't a team. And if you see our team on paper, I don't know how we got relegated, to be honest. It's ridiculous. Mm. Um, so, um, clip from watch? Yeah, you, I'm going to play you something. from. You're talking about teammates now. Yeah. As I said to you, I spoke to one yeah. of your former teammates, Darren Fletcher. And uh, yeah. Would you give me a couple of words on Saido? And I don't ask for positive or negative. He just they just give me this. Yes, mate. Got a lot of time for Saido. He's a good kid. Um, honestly, when I first signed, can't speak highly enough of him. He played as a number 10 between the lines and he was unbelievable, mate. Fired the ball into him, dealt with it. His touch was on point. Strong, strong, received it well. Nobody took it off him. Um, always demanding the ball in there as well. Great enthusiasm for the game in terms of how much he practiced and how much he loved football and how he trained. Um, unbelievable goal scorer and finisher. Outside the box, whip, top bins. Um, always pulled out a little bit, so always seen him more as a number 10. But he wasn't afraid to like dart in behind. And honestly, for the first however long before that Tottenham transfer came in, he was he was almost unplayable. Um, even the work rate that he was asked to do, almost like being a striker, then dropping back in as being a midfielder to form a five beside us. Um, got on with it, did it for the team. Work rate and attitude was spot on. He let the Tottenham, the club rejecting the bid from Tottenham affect him too much. Completely lost his head, lost his way and <sighs> struggled to recover from that, really, from that point. Um, and it's a shame, really, because talent was unbelievable. Yeah, he was young and listen, he was frustrating at times. He was late and then he'd always be like, make try to make you feel sorry for him. It was never his fault, but it was just part of the grown up process and being young. Wasn't a bad kid, doesn't didn't cause any problems, had big ambition. Wanted to, you know, wanted to really kick on in the game and, and loved the game. <laughs> Is that a good appraisal of of you yourself, Sido? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's totally honest. Um, that's one thing I liked about Fletcher. He was, a, he was a great captain to have, man. He was one that would pull you to the side and say how it is. And um, I never had that stock. Even though he was there, he could tell you himself he was difficult at Stoke compared to West Brom. Hmm. Talking about Stoke, it leads us on um, to like, obviously, when you're, when you're there and you see the differences in, in squads, um, and later on in your career, not not too long ago, you got someone like Glenn Johnson who, who who spoke about you not signing, or if he was a manager, he wouldn't sign you type thing. Um, which is, I, I feel, if, if you're st st almost stopping someone from getting a, a living, is kind of crazy. But obviously, if you was if you was yourself now, and you you was someone like in Glenn's position who had a young player within the squad who was having difficulties and having issues, how would you address that situation? I would always approach it like the guys did at West Brom for me. Um, I would have spoke to him, got my hands around around him, asked him how he is, asking him how he's settled in. You know, me and Glenn Johnson, I think we've, we've never spoken onto a one-to-one -one conversation. And he sat next to me. This is the greatest thing. He sat next to me. He was always on his phone, um, just doing what he was doing, really. He never even lived anywhere near his store. He was living in London, getting a train every day. So when he came out, it was crazy. And I, and, I, and I remember calling my agent saying, is this guy for real? Like the guy was, changed, was getting changed next to me every day. I never had the decency to say, yo, Silo, come on. You're doing this or you're doing that. You're doing that or doing this. Especially with the qualities that he had, the, the career that he had, speaking to me won't be a big thing to him. But you rather go and do it in front of millions of people on a radio station for what? It's not gaining anything from me. So I never understood his angle with that. The only thing that I can relate that to is because me and his old agent, me and my, my um, me and his agent David Manassi had a problem before. So maybe 
it could be from that. Mm. But then again, I don't see I don't see him. I don't see why he did that. To be honest, it was crazy. Mm. Did you think it was unfair? Um, the comments that he made. A thousand percent. There's no ex player or player that's ever gone out and spoke about another player the way he did. That's like one of the rules in the change room. I could sit here and say anything about what I heard or saw in the change room. I will never, because that's just I just find it childish. And that whole conversation interview that he had was childish from his behaviour. Childish. What was the score with the Tottenham move that didn't happen and uh, you threatening to go on strike? How true was all of the accounts of that and what's your take on it? I never threatened to go on no strike, um, but I was really, really heartbroken. Imagine, this is how heartbroken I was. Imagine me and my mum being called in into the meeting at West Brom in front of the chairman, Jeremy Pierce. He sits down and he says, look, your son is not going nowhere in front of my mom. He's not going nowhere. If they don't give me 30 million or a higher bid, he's not going nowhere. And my mom's starting to cry. This is how bad it was. She started to cry in the office. So we left. And then that's when I tweeted that thing like, oh my God, I can't play for Jeremy Pierce anymore. And that's how deep it was because he made my mom cry in front of of me you know and then i've never really seen her crying that way like she was just so upset until this day she still holds grudges towards the, the man um, and i never recovered from that i'm not gonna lie i never recovered from that i tried it took me two years to even find the back of the net did you was I that just you you thought you know what i'm i'm not I, I, i've got to this point where i've given everything and and still people are holding me back and you just thought you know what that's me i'm done is that how you felt I just felt like I was, I almost felt like the game that I loved became something that I never thought it would be. At that age, I was looking around and starting the politics. Like I had six months left on my West Brom contract. And they were, they were selling me, they sold me for 15 million. And I remember that day, they just called me like, yes, look, we've agreed a deal, you gotta go, you gotta go now, 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 two days before the window closed. And I'm like, what? But because I wanted to leave West Brom anyway, I just left and went. Hmm. Um, I want to take it back really quickly. Um, you spoke about your times at West Brom and you actually said you had great leaders, great people around you. I want you to explain your relationship with Tony Pulis because after doing uh, some research and listening, I think that's a very surprising relationship. Can you explain us uh, what that was like? Right, Tony Pulis was amazing. Like towards me, it was really great because he knew what he wanted, and if you don't follow his rules, then you're out of the team. It was simple as that. So he used to play these little mind games. For example, if you're eating dinner, he would just come to your place and be like, "That's my check, get up," and you'd have to stand up and leave where he was eating. So he always had to make you feel like he's the boss and you're down here. That was his thing. So like there will be other times where he will come in his office. I said, "I'll come here, go make me a cup of tea, and I'll go make him tea." And be like, "This is too dark. I want this other tea bag." Da-da. Just little mind games, but tactically fantastic manager. Like he knew how to set up a team to beat anyone. He he was one manager that I saw. I set pieces. He took extra time and details. To, to 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 get players ready for that. And we were like, our set pieces were like penalties in the Premier League. So I, I love working with him, man. We got, and we had we had loads of days off, man, under Tony Pulis. We had a great time. Say though, I want to know a little bit about um you've you obviously played for England up to under 21 level and you've recently switched over to the yeah. Burundi national team. Talk to us. My camera's wigging out here, isn't it? Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what it means for you to to represent Burundi and for younger players growing up, maybe idolising you like you did for some of the Afcon players when you were growing up. Um, for me, I didn't know how massive it was until I actually went back home in Burundi. I remember the way the man, the welcome that I got was like 
Oh man, someone for now, man. It's literally, the airport was full. People shouting my name and crazy. You're like a superstar there, was... right? Yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. And we managed to qualify for the first time ever in history. This is what took me to another level. So people now start thinking, he came first season qualification. Boom, we've gone African Cup. So it was unbelievable. And then we qualified, and then. The president actually said Saido's got to be captain for the tournament. Of course, at the tournament, we were, there, we were just there adding numbers. We were rubbish. We got slapped left, right, center. <laughs> but apart from that, it was a great experience. And it, it meant a lot, man. It really meant a lot to be there. It really meant a lot. Est-ce que votre français est très bien maintenant? C'est toujours bien ou bien? C'est comment? Oh, shut up, Joel. <laughs> Mais toi, tu parles français? Oui, bien sûr, je parle français. Parlez-vous anglais yeah. <rire> Eh oui, un petit peu. <rire> T'es congolais Oui, congolais. C'est là tout le monde. Je m'appelle Rio. J'habite à London. Good day, sir. Hey, Rio, you should, try, you, you, you should try and do interviews in Africa, man. I have to speak three, four languages when I'm out there. But this is the thing, like, like obviously, you... You've got a certain image that people have portrayed of you in the media. It's so different for someone. How many languages do you speak? Four. So, so he four needs languages. French, Kirundi. That's what I mean. Four languages. Yeah. Ten GCSEs. You're not. You're not a silly boy. Do you know what I mean? But people will try and have you different. Um, and and that, that talk us through obviously yeah. the power of social media and the effect that's had on you in your career. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely, man. Yeah. And, It hasn't been easy to take, man. You know, some things that, mate, I had some stories, man. I had some crazy stories. I remember the craziest one, one story that I had, even, um, what was the manager's name? The Scottish one with the guys. Paul Lambert called me in the office. So there was a story about a 49-year-old woman came to my house, slept with me. Then, she, then I was playing Xbox, which I don't have. Then I was scoring goals on Xbox. And then she said, well, You're not scoring in real life. What the hell are you doing? Then I got mad wow. and kicked out the house. So Paul Lambert oh, called me mean. in. He was like, what the hell is this? I don't I've had, yeah, I've had enough of this newspaper. Every day I see you on the newspaper more than the bloody news. I was like, this is fake. I don't have an Xbox. So there was things like that and I had to deal with. Another story I had, <laughs> I had three paparazzi outside my house for five days trying to get a story parked up call the police but because they're on a road they're not on my property private land they said they can't does that does that make it hard for you to concentrate and do your job which and, and what you love and your passion which is play football because you don't go into football expecting all of this stuff is it hard to deal with that 100 you know every morning i had to come up with a way of driving off without them getting a picture of me So I'm driving, can't even see the road, like sit back all the way back. It was just, it was just not fair on me. I think at the time it wasn't fair on me. And I, and I, and I, I was living with my mom. So it was really tough on my mom mm. seeing all of this stuff, you know. Um, and I just didn't get it. It's not like I was playing for England, scoring 20 goals a season in the English Premier League. Or I was at Stoke with no goals after two seasons. And they still mm. wanted a story of me. Mm. So, yeah. Do you feel like you've driven away out of England? 100%. I mm. hated, I hated playing. When I was at Stoke, I hated playing in England. I just hated the, the way the media was. I just hated how people just had this bad image of me. From when I left West Brom, I just had this dark cloud that was following everywhere I went. And it became more and more darker and darker as I, as I, as days went by. Even got worse. I started getting robbed. I start people start pulling up and robbing me and stuff. Pulling up and robbing you. Yeah. So I, I got What? robbed in London. What of 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 like what your belongings and stuff? Yeah. So the reason why I got sacked at Stoke is because of that robbery. So you got sacked because you got robbed? 100%. So How's I that got work? robbed and I tend to me. So this is how it went. So 
I had a I had a reserve game right to the following day, and I went out in a restaurant with my missus, my niece, and her boyfriend. So when I was out there, having a little bit of drink, and then um, these guys are coming. Is that Berahino? Is that Berahino? Start chasing me in. I don't know if you you're aware where VQ is in Chelsea, VQ mm. restaurant. Mm. Yeah. So got robbed. Um, in the ten of me, I tried to run away from them. They took all my stuff and then after I went back and got in my car and I drove 10 seconds away. But bear in mind, I've got cuts in my hand, cuts in my face. My top is ripped by the knives and stuff that they had. So when the police came, I was scared and they said, we've been called around this area and there's been a robbery. You just like, nothing like So me thinking about the media and I've said, no, 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 nothing's fine. I'm fine. Da, da, da. But when I'm saying this, they could see my hand bleeding. So they had to find out why that happened. So they they said, okay, we got to breathalyze you. So as they breathalyzed me, they found out that I was drink driving. So then I wow. started telling the whole story. As I've told them the whole story, I've gone into the police station. I was there for six hours. The Daily Mail got the story already. So Ido Berahino has been arrested for drink driving. Completely ignored the fact that I've been robbed on gun and knife point, which the court had in um, seen the CCTV. So Stoke then's argument was, well, you had a reserve game, you shouldn't have been out. Um, you know the rules, 48 hours, you can't be out before a, a reserve game. So yeah, we've had enough of you. You've been late numerous times. You have to go. And that was it. That was literally it. And that's how we went down. Wow, that's crazy, think, man. Uh, yeah. Did you think that was fair? What's your view on it? Hell no. When I see the likes of Jack Grealish, got 80,000, still at Villa. I seen another guy drink water, crash into a building, I believe, still there. The only people got sacked really was the W boys, if I'm correct. I'm not too sure if they got sacked. But... Um, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that was just my luck in England, man. They've just had enough of me. I think they were disappointed that with the money they spent on me, they weren't getting any results on the pitch. And I had a long contract, a five-year deal on a good amount of money. So maybe they felt that they needed to break away somehow from that. Would you consider England as your home still? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, so you can see yourself playing back in the Premier League one day. Yeah, hopefully, I would love to play back at West Brom. I think that 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 would be my my main target. Um, I hope the really? Even if you said there was a, a dark cloud with West Brom, you'd still go back. Hundred percent. Interesting. Hundred percent. He's twenty-seven it's years old. I followed. I followed them so much. I followed them so deeply that if I went back, I think I'll, I would die playing for them, really. Because that's it's crazy, that's yeah. What I so you know, in England. It's the, 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 uh, yeah. like you say, West Brom made you fall in love with football in England. You say, yeah, and it's crazy. We've been speaking, and there's been quite obviously you're scarred from quite a few things that have happened while you was here, and some people would have you believe that you're a yeah. certain type of character. But I, I saw some quotes from your manager in Belgium not long ago, how speaking so positively about you, how you're like a, you've become the, the elder statesman in the dressing room helping the younger players. How have you found it transitioning from being that young, inexperienced, um, in your own words, maybe attention seeking young kid to now being the elder statesman who's trying to help the next generation? Because that's what I hear about what you're doing right now. Man, it's not an easy role to play, man. I don't know how easy you boys did it, man. You feel like the youngsters just do your head in sometimes, man, with the littlest <laughs> things. Like, like somebody used to it just come, people come in late. That, that used to do my head in. I used to look back and think, that's me. Like, I used to do that every morning. Why is it doing my head in? So I'll pull them, I'll speak to them. But it's heavy, man. It's heavy. Like, when the manager calls you in and says, how do you feel about the team today? Who do you think should start? Or how do you feel about doing this and that? 
and then you go home and all you think about tactics how can the team be better how can we play better but when you're young after training all you care about is where's my ps4 where's my <laughs> social media where's my instagram where's my girls are you know what i mean you don't really think about tactics but being the one of the more experienced lads in the training room has been it's been challenging man it's made me appreciate football more and absolutely respect managers even more even more so you seem pretty happy at the moment. I mean, when you're talking about your new life now in uh, Belgium, etc., would yeah. you say that when you were in English football, you went through a stage of depression? Because what it, it sounds like is that you've gone through years of turmoil. Again, it's not to say that you are, you know, you were like you've admitted. It's not to say that you were without fault. But did you feel some sort of sadness within your life during that time? Oh yeah, massively, massively. I'm not gonna lie to you. My time at Stoke was full, full of depression. I was stressed. Stoke tried to help me, but they stabbed me in the back as well during that time. Which I don't want to talk about it, but you know, I had various different psychologists try to help me, but um, one thing. One thing that didn't agree with me when it came to people like psychologists, people that help you mentally and mental, was that the ones that I had didn't really challenge my brain enough. And I almost felt like seeing them made me ask myself even more deeper and sad questions. I look at myself, instead of making me feel better, I always question myself after having a session with them. So I tried to run away from them. but. Yeah, the Stoke period for me was really difficult. Really, really difficult. How important do you feel, given that you've, you're have you opening up here about depression, uh, a period of your life, how important do you think it is, one, to talk and to, to engage with teammates uh, and the staff at a football club when you're there, but also to, to have that help and reach out for that help? How important do you feel for young players? Because many young players are going through that. We've heard of young kids, the young boy at Manchester City, who uh, unfortunately took his life recently and mental health is a huge part now how important do you think it is and what steps can clubs take now do you think it's very important to i feel like teams should have that one mentor that knows a player from the age of for example 16 17 all the way through because one thing that i realized as a youngster with the social media platform that we have now everybody's under pressure everybody's building some sort of uh some sort of level that they need to reach some friends are lying to them they are seeing other other peers of theirs surpassing them so the pressure is constant and i think football clubs really can have a mentor that sees them on a daily basis give them exercises to challenge their brain make them think differently to just being a footballer, it will help massively. And I actually had that when I came to Belgium. So our team, as professionals, we had a mentor. He used to give you a task every week, He'd give you a little booklet. You have to write certain things, not just football, just life in general, and he improved you and made you more aware of yourself than you just focusing on football, football, football. I think that's what Premier League really need to, to have. And I think there was a great guy that we had at West Brom called Tom Bates. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. He's at Villa, I think, now. He was a psychologist. What do you think yeah, that should look like at every club? Is that, is that a job for an ex-player? Or is that a job for a coach or a psychologist? Or if you was moving back to England now and you was talking to West Brom and you said, hire this guy, who's what's your ideal guy for that role? It's a good question. I think you have to be just a good mentor, man. Somebody that's got a good background of life experiences, understands a bit about high performance athlete, about life, about brotherhood, fatherhood. He's got to know everything because if you just put in an ex footballer there, he's going to talk to you about how the training go, <laughs> how, what did you eat, did you rest up well? <laughs> It's going to become a repetition thing. It's going to be boring and your brain won't be challenged. But if you have somebody that's 
knows a bit about everything, it would be totally different. Um, I think, yeah, he's got to be somebody that knows a bit of everything, really. Do you have anything like that at United or anywhere when you was playing? Yeah, when I went to United really early on, um, actually it was at the back end of when I was at Leeds and then when I signed for United, I still had him. I, had the, I was with the guy for about a year, a guy called Keith Power. I don't even know what he's doing now. I've not spoke to him for years, but I've done it for about a year where I had I, I, I saw a sports psychologist um, and it wasn't about my mental health. It was more just about preparing and for games and getting to try to be the best footballer I could be. Um, but it did make me understand that the mind is a powerful thing, that if you challenge your mind and engage your mind for particular elements, then you can see benefits. And I saw that with my performance. Um, and then obviously in the latter parts of, of my life, um, there I had some issues, um, family stuff with uh, people passing away. And so speaking to people, um, seeing psychologists, being involved in groups um, was a huge, huge, huge benefit. And I think the, these young players, players that are, are mature players as well, can only benefit, I, I believe, from talking and opening up and being part of these um, psychologist sessions um, to help them in these down times. And listen, it's, it's very different to players from who began in my era and before me to these kids now. There's so much more pressure. It's, it's like night and day, it's so different. Like Saido was saying, the, the social media pressure of living up to expectations, living up to what pe other people are doing. Um, that's a pressure in itself that is almost it's unachievable to, to probably 99.9% .9 of people to achieve everything that they're seeing on, and, and on social media. So that pressure in itself is, is, is a killer. And obviously the pressure of playing football. And I think these little things that you've like, like what people probably sometimes forget about, like you said all your life as a young boy, young girl, I play for West Brom. I'm at West Brom's Academy. I'm just been signed now as a scholar. I've just been signed as a pro. I'm in the first team. I'm doing well. Then one day you say that I, I'm not, or even at a younger age, you get released as a, just after your scholar or your scholar, you get released and you've got to go back to Sunday football or something like that to then go, go to family gatherings or people on social media asking, are you not, you're not seeing the pictures at West Brom no more? Are you not a West Brom? Do you know how hard that must be for a young kid to have to address that and to speak about that? That's, that's a terrifying scenario. Like to, that, that ego, your pride has gone after being the person that walked around with the badge on your chest the whole time. Now the badge has been taken away. How do you recover? How do you rebuild? These are techniques I think that need to be put into these young young players, these young kids at school for disappointment because life is full of disappointments. And I don't know if we, we teach our children, our young football players enough to be able to cope with that once it does happen. Do you talk to any uh, current young footballers, would you say, where you, you give a helping hand back in England in the Premier League? Who, me? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't talk to them about their careers, but if I see certain things on Snapchat or Instagram that they're doing that I wish I never done at a young age, I'll definitely tell them. Uh, there's a few guys that are not at West Brom still, some that have moved on. Um, so, yeah, we keep each other entertained, but when there's, when there's time to be professional, I, I kind of do say some stuff. Am I right in thinking I saw something about um, uh, a, an English club wanting to sign you in the last window or, or something like you came close to happening? Um, not sign. I, I, I had I had um, I had a few interests back home, but it just didn't happen with the COVID and stuff. Uh, mm. Yeah, it didn't happen, man. It didn't happen. Is that something you're interested but in? When doing? I was at Stoke, I was close. Yeah, come back here. Yeah, I've, I've said it before, 100%. I would love to come back to England. I think this holiday period away of two seasons has cleared my head now. I'm in a better place. That's good to hear. But yeah, I've, I miss that. I miss that morning feeling, man. I miss that morning feeling, waking up knowing it's game day, man. Over here, bro, I just got... There's a, there's a dog man watching us, man. There's no one on... No one talks about any games here. Hmm. You want that spark back? 
Yeah, man. man. Yeah, man. You were saying about Stoke. Uh, you said when you were at Stoke, there was it almost happened. There was interest to do what? Yeah. You were saying. So when I was at Stoke, right, I was close to going back to playing for West Brom. Wow. And they've come back now, trying to take me on loan. So Darren Moore was really interested in taking me back on loan. And then last minute. The owners just said, how would that look if he goes back and starts banging in goals and he can't do it for us? And we just bought the kid for nine, uh, nine, uh, 15 million. So they just put a block on that. Wow. Darren Moore, he's actually a manager now, isn't he? He's manager, he's just got a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just got a job. I actually uh, texted him to say congrats on that. Me and him still keep a good relationship man he was the first player i saw at west brom when i signed in under 12. So he was a captain he had the the ken rolls back then can you imagine <laughs> diamond more ken rolls bro <laughs> <laughs> wow you have to hit him up again just say give me a deal i got a new contract man give me a little year contract and let me come and bang some goals in for chef wednesday <laughs> and for real man i told you you gotta stay in the championship man next year i'm coming to help you man no oh, good. Um, yeah. Sido, I want to bring it back a little bit now. So you've had the chance of playing with some really good players. You mentioned one of my all-time favourites, Nicholas Anelka. Uh, you know, what were some positive words that he said to you? And also, just to lead on, you had the chance to play for England at under-21s level. I want to know how much of an impact Gareth Southgate was on your life. So first, Nicholas, then Gareth. Good question, Joe. Good question. Good. Um, Nico, wow. Nico was a, how can I put it? He was a man with so much wisdom. He knew about politics. He knew about religion. He knew about football. He had his head wrapped around everything. I remember pre-season, Steve Clark used to tap my shoulder and said, hey, stop staying around the big boys' table. Go sleep. They're going to ruin your head. Because we'll be on the table after dinner. He will be speaking for three hours. I mean, everybody will just be listening to Nico. Like, what's he saying? What's he saying? But a lot of one thing that he told me that I'll never forget. He said, "I worked for my name. Now my name works for me. So if you want to have a long career, you got to work for that name first. So everybody respects who you are as a player." Then when you toward the back end of your career, that name will work for you. So that's mm. one thing that always stuck in my head. Um, and then yeah, man. And then Gareth Gareth Southgate. Gareth Southgate was just um, he worked well with Steve Holland. Um, he was one of the guys that gave you freedom. We had freedom under Gareth. I don't even think we had fines. He was really laid back. Training was always fun. Steve Holland always brought that quality level uh, of training sessions. The, the boys were great. Made the team itself was unbelievable. Harry Kane, Zaha, Sterling, Robert Morrison. The name, the list goes on Lingard. It was just crazy. We won two years on B and B and everybody. Um, so, yeah, man, the bunch, the boys were really good. We all got on really well. And Gareth just, just polished all of us. And I was grateful for, for him giving me an opportunity to play every game. I started every game on the him. I scored every game for him. And I was playing ahead of great players, Danny Ings, Harry Kane and stuff. So you played in front of Harry Kane to England on 21s, yeah? And you played under Gareth Southgate. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to go into the Euros. Do you see him being a defensive-minded coach? Or do you see him being someone with all the attacking players that we've got? And you mentioned all the attacking players you had in your team and you was allowed freedom. Do you see that being the same case in this team in the summer? 100%. I'm sure of it. Because the way he used to have us set up, he wanted us more rotations. Don't stay in one place. Work together as a three, as a four. And I think we've seen a little bit of that in the World Cup, how the boys were free. You had Rashford moving around, Sterling moving around, Harry Kane moving around, and we scored a lot of goals as well. So, yeah, man, I, I can see that freedom being passed on to them. And and these boys, man, they're taking it on, man. They, they, they're making English football 
uh, more exciting now. I'm seeing like we're free at the back sometimes and stuff like that. So it's good, man. It's good to see. It's good to see what Gareth and Steve Holland do, man. It's, it's working. Uh, you, yeah. Harry Kane being your backup striker for the under 21s, did you see him doing what he's doing now? Always. Real, I've never seen a clinical finisher in my life than Harry Kane. He hits a ball with his left foot and his right foot. Like, you know how a golfer hits a ball? How clean he sounds. That, that's him. Left foot, right foot, clean. Left foot, right foot, clean. I've never seen somebody strike a ball better than Harry Kane. Wow. Ever. He just, wow. and, and his head was so, it was like two times ahead of everybody. He knew what he wanted to do with the ball. Always. Mm. What was training like then? Because that's some serious names. And for you to be ahead of him, you must have been moving mad. <laughs> it was weird. It was weird, man. Because he, I think he was having a little bit of bad spell at Leicester or Norwich at the time. I can't remember where it was. It wasn't really playing as much. And obviously, I was doing well of scoring a Premier League under West Brom. And I wasn't even playing a striker. I was a winger. I was 11. Mm. But training, man, training used to be a little five side. Put Raheem Sterling in one team, put Zaha in another team. Just give them the ball. The 1v1 competition. They don't pass <laughs> the ball to nobody. <laughs> 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 oh, man. They never used to pass it. Nobody. He does a trick. The other one does a trick. So he, it was great, man. He was great. What well, about Raheem? Raheem? You said Raheem was in your squad as well. How, was he? Did you see him being the player he is today, scoring that many goals, being one of the best wide players, attacking players in 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 world football, like he's doing? I think one thing that Raheem can say personally that Pep improved him massively took him to another level raheem was not a known goal, goal scorer he wasn't a great finisher but i think by improving that side of the game he put him towards the elite well the world-class players he started scoring double figures every season now before that raheem was great sometimes his end product wasn't the best as a winger but he always was a danger man and when he went to ce he took that extra extra level and now, man, now is almost a complete player for me. He's scoring with headers. I remember seeing Raheem head head a ball in training, let alone in a game. <laughs> so, so yeah, man, you can see Pep doing a great job with him. Done a great job. Well, listen, really appreciate your time, Saido, man. No, 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 Rio. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Let's go <laughs> back to that game. Nah, I'm not having it. Let's go back to the game when you played against <laughs> Manchester well, United. Rio is going to try and duck out. When we game, beat... you know? <laughs> I was going, bro. I'm finished. I'm finished now. <laughs> yeah, no way. Hey, Rio, before we start oh, asking him man, questions... you're that yeah. game. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Let's ask Rio before he ducks out, yeah? Talk to us about what you thought about Saido yeah. after that game. What game wait. was it? Well, you know the game. 28th of September. <laughs> you know the game. You know... You know... He knows really nah, right. man, we got beat, innit? Talk us through the nutmeg, bro. <laughs> the nutmeg? Yeah. <laughs> was there a nutmeg? Uh, there was. Yeah, not was. me, not me, not me. Morgan. I know, I know. Goal. Yeah. Who was it? He knows. Uh, uh, it was... Ah, was um, uh, what's that? Yeah. Ami Morgan yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. You know what happened? My studs got caught in the in the grass, didn't it? My studs got caught. <laughs> so I just I don't know what happened. Did what we win the league that year? Uh... Who are you? Huh? Steve, did we win the league that year? No. Was it 13, uh, no, 12, 13? Yeah, no, no, no. You didn't. No, no. You didn't win the league that year. What year was it? You did 13, 14. Oh, no, we did not win the league that year. What year is it? You see them yeah, times I, mean, I was watching... I'm an Arsenal fan, but I was watching Man United like crazy. What's going on this week? I was loving. Now, you know what we, we we what we done that year, yeah, is we had to give other people an opportunity, and so when we used to go, out... <laughs> yeah, we didn't have to give. No, you, you know what I would say? Though, didn't we? I would say playing against West Brom, it was always a tough game down there, man. Always hard, hard games down there. Fergie's last game was a mad one. Um, 
but always under the lights as well in the evenings, midweek games. They were hard games, man. And we, they were never, very rarely we went there and absolutely yeah. blew West Brom away. Tight old pitch. Um, fans always on you. Two story uh, Greg's next door, by the way. Yeah. And you had a good side there, man. Good bunch of players. <laughs> but it was always, always good. And I remember Saida, I, you play against players and over the years, and, and I have to say Saida was one of them where you, you, when you watch the clips and you're doing your, your, your training your mind before the game, you know that off both feet he's going to shoot early. So you, when players are like that, any striker I played against who I thought he's going to shoot, he could shoot early and he's accurate. He's got a quick release. You have to be on your toes. And I used to always try and get up against and close enough to kind of put him, make him pass the ball backwards rather than having getting his head up and being able to shoot because I knew that once he'd done that, he was quite clinical in them situations. So, again, that's testament to me uh, having to really focus on something like that because he had them attributes. Would you say, Rio, would you say you would ever be a manager? Um, before I had the issues in my private life with um, my family, I would have 100% gone in to be a manager. I would have done all my badges, tried and, and, and got hopefully got a job and had a chance. Um, but with the situation, what happened and stuff, I think my children need me to kind of be there um, more than yeah. ever. I think like, and my wife, and I think it's, it's more about if you're a manager, you, you're there. Before you get to the training ground, your mind's thinking about it. When you get there, you're obviously fully focused. When you yeah. go home, your mind is still doing it on football. Whereas a player... You can switch off. As a manager, you never switch off. And I, 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 that's not something I can do right now. So at the moment, I have to say no. I don't hear of many managers doing half days. No, 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 no. What did you say, Sido? I had a job for you as well. Great team. <laughs> Good team, yeah? National team. <laughs> yeah, man. Great team in Belgium, man. You see your guy, your guy came out here. Do you, do you speak to Paul Clement? Is Paul Clement? Is Paul Clement? Yeah, the, the one who was the assistant manager for Carlo Ancelotti at PSG. That's Real Madrid. Yeah, man. He was, yeah, he was over here, you know. He was a manager here this season. Oh, All right, man. It was a pleasure, man, guys. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time, man. Listen, again, we wish you the world, the world of luck, man. Good luck. And... Listen, I've got to be honest, after speaking to you especially, I'd love to see you come back. Um, I feel you've got unfinished business here in the UK and I think you seem like a really focused individual now who's acknowledged he's made mistakes here and there, but also he's been, sh he's been painted in, a, in a, 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 probably a, a light that doesn't really reflect who he really was. So, um, yeah, I'd love to see you get that opportunity now back here in England if that, if that comes and I feel you grab it with both hands. So good luck and we wish you well. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Cheers, Saito. Thank you, guys. Right. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> See you guys. That was an, a real interesting interview, um, Rio. Um, Steve, the only thing I can really think of, if I'm honest with you, obviously it's great. He's cleared up a lot of stuff that I didn't know. There's always more behind the scenes. But when I think about punctuality, I'm starting to see a trend here. And um, for people like us who haven't played professional football, I think sometimes you question, you go, rah, what, can you just roll in, roll in whenever you want, you know what I mean, to training and stuff like that? Could that run at Man United, Rio? I don't think it's just about Manchester United. I think it's about, it's at clubs who have got a certain culture that don't accept stuff like that. I think the, whether it's a, a top club who, or a big club who's winning, but it's, it's just about the culture. It could be a small club. If that if that changing room is run and that environment is run the right way with the right individuals in there, then you, you, you them individuals in there don't allow for that. And I, I look at the change rooms that I was in at Man United, people turning up late, whether it's it being led with an iron fist or ridicule for people who are, who are late or whatever. There was maybe a couple of players that every now and again, once in a blue moon were late, but it's once in a blue moon you're late because you get drilled. And maybe there wasn't maybe enough players or doing that, or there maybe wasn't enough um, people there that would help to manage certain individuals that you saw had issues with stuff like this. And look, look, look listening to Saido there, he was a young kid who, yes, he was immature, like most young kids, 
but needed something else, needed that individual time. Well, he spoke um, about it, didn't he? He mentioned the mentor that he's got over there in, in Belgium. I think that sounds mm. like a mega idea. I, mm. I can't believe, you know, when you find out actually how little Premier League clubs really help like new signings settle in, even foreign signings, they just kind of sign them and go, see a training tomorrow morning. And they don't know the city. They don't know um, the taxi routes. They don't know, am I getting the tram? Is it safe to get the tram? Do I get a taxi? Have I got a driver? Like little things like that. I know everyone's an adult, but you think if you spent 40, 50, 60 million pounds on a player, wouldn't you assign someone like 30 grand a year to, to make sure that this guy settles into the city and is a success? Yeah, but I think football in, in general is probably quite a way behind a lot of other industries in that respect. Uh, in like, If you invest in something, a big corporate company invest in an individual or something, they normally safeguard it with certain mechanisms around it that enable it to actually like, progress and improve and then get to the final part, which is actually coming to do what you do, is which is to win things or to achieve things. Mm. Whereas football is very behind in that sense and I think football's only just now really catching on to mental health mm. and understanding that it's such a huge part it's such a big part to any player's makeup in being successful and it, it, we, we've seen other sports in Australia especially America that mental element and the, the mental coaching and stuff that they have going on is so far ahead of what it's like in football and if you don't reach out as an individual for stuff like that to, to, to help with mental health stuff in football in the years that I played and it's improving now, but still I think there's scope to improve more. If, if you don't reach out yourself and try and engage on that and on that side of things, you, you don't get that, that help. Mm. You almost also no, uh, mentioned, well, you, he mentioned actually uh, the mental health stuff. He's looking after younger players, etc. I know I've said it before in our previous podcast, I've seen you speak to, England youth teams, Man United Academy. Is this a role that you would consider even more, Rio? Because I'm not just saying it because we're in a podcast, but you seem like you're a natural fit for that kind of stuff. You've experienced life. Yeah, it's something that I love doing. I enjoy it. I think you, I know the benefits of having someone who's been through it and seen seen the path that I'm looking to tread. I know that, that I would engage more with someone like that as a young player. When I was a kid, I used to listen to the senior pros loads. I was like a sponge. And I think there's loads of kids out there that want to be like that and want that and maybe don't get the opportunity sometimes. Um, but I think someone like Saido, he's, he's, he's lived a, a real eventful life in that sense, coming from another country, not speaking a language, learning, um, all that goes with that. And then the trials and tribulations of playing football and it not going perfectly well he is someone who's primed to be able to talk to the next generation and that's why I love talking to kids and people like him because it's not been a plain sailing journey and I think so many children and so many parents nowadays believe and see the fruits and see the internationals and the commercial deals that come with it and all the success and the, the joy but I think it's also good to see that there are some times where there's going to be big bumps in the roads and you've got to be prepared for it and and especially that's why I enjoy doing this is that you, you see and you understand and you get a good real insight into what actually does go on behind clo closed doors. And like the situation when he almost signed for Spurs and his mum was there crying because it had been, the, the, it had been declined the offer, they declined it. What that must mean to a mum, I'm a parent now. And, I, and if my son, I know my son's desperate to get to a certain level and there's a club there willing to pay big money for him. And then this club you're at declines the offer and says, no, and probably being a bit greedy and stopping your son and your family from making that move. I, I understand why his mum's crying because it's a, it's a, it's their dream. It's what they've been living for and waiting for. Now, obviously Sido's problem was that he, he, he let it affect him too much. And then it comes back to the point is, did he have that father figure around him after his father had passed away to help him through that situation? No, he didn't. And that's where you feel that you need that extra help at a club you need someone maybe at West, we needed someone at West Brom maybe to say, listen, come here and, and help him through that situation, that stage. But that's an experience I'm sure that in his next phase of his life will, will lead him into to, to, to a good place because right now he looks like a kid who's ready to really get back on the, on the horse and start going. I know um, your kids don't believe it, but you could play a little bit back in the day. Um, I remember it. How many lifetimes do you reckon you'd need if we just picked you up 
on your own at 10, took you to France or Italy or somewhere where you don't speak any other language, how, how many lifetimes do you think you'd need to make a professional footballer out of that? Oh, ridiculous. Oh, get 10 GCSEs as well. Yeah, it's it's like it, what he's achieved is near on like it's like a miracle to even get where he got and, and to to get through school, let alone sign for a Premier League football team. But I think what comes out of that is that the football is such a universal sport that it just ties people together. And if you can kick a ball around and play football, then it opens so many doors. Yeah, because he's going to have gone into a school playground, didn't he? Made friends instantly with a big cheeky smile and load of skills. Yeah. And then, you know, everything else falls off that. I think that's a massive underestimated part of sport that people don't look into as much. I think growing up, a lot of us had friends through sport, you know, through college and sport and stuff like that. And I think it's a it's a massive gateway, especially for young men, to to sort of open up and, and show who we are a little bit. I think that, mm. and I, I don't know, without going completely off topic here, I think that's one of the, the problems that we've had over the last 12 months where, the, the importance of playing sport has just been absolutely relegated for everything. Hmm. No, no, I agree. And, and it's, it's mad. He had a, he went into a state of depression. Yeah. Like at a football club and you think, surely someone's got to see that in there. And, and, and that's what, that's why I really agree with what he was saying about having a mentor within a football club who's there for, to see these situations. Like for a kid not to get a move, you know there's going to be an impact, a negative impact somewhere. And you need someone who's actually focused on that type of stuff and ready and waiting to pick up the pieces. Because again, it's, it's, it's an investment for a football club. And I think that person who, in that role is a huge, he's, he, he makes a big difference, I'm sure, to the, um, the, the spreadsheets, but also to individuals in helping them with their life. Surely from a selfish point of view as well, from a club, if you've invested money into this lad, just as a pure selfish reason to help him through whatever he needs to, to be helped through means that you've still got money in that player that you can make a profit from three, four years down the line once his contract's coming to an end. Like, I don't understand why they're not doing it, even just from, you know, forget about doing it for the human aspect, but even just from a pure business and selfish aspect, I don't get why clubs aren't doing this because you just I, waste I think the big part of that, Steve, though, is that the, the English... British psyche hasn't been about understanding mental health, especially in a in a, a macho environment, which men's football is. But when, men and women football, I think, is an area where mental health now is, is, in, and beyond football in English society, British society, it's becoming a buzzword now. And it's, it's become a, an area that people are focusing on a lot more and they're understanding the benefits that, that come with it. So I think we're, we're going to see more and more. My kids are in the system playing football there are people helping with the mental side of the games in, in, in these um, academies now. There are people there doing that. So these clubs are aware. We're just talking to people that are in the midst of their career, professional careers now, or just coming to the end of it, that haven't had that. And that's just a reflection of, of British society, I think. I think the good thing is, uh, like what we said, he, he, he knows, you know, areas that he, he needed to improve in. It's like, he sounds like he's mentally ready as well. He's only mm. 27 years old. So hopefully, mm. you know, we see him back in England. Uh, and yeah, shout out to you, Rio, as well, for uh, bringing on these kind of guys. You know what I mean? It's an important chat and uh, it's interesting, you know? So yeah, hope to Do you know what's crazy as well? Because my, my kids said to me the other day, Dad, man, when you're getting on these superstars, man, you need to get a superstar on. It's me, when, you, when these boys were your age, they were superstars. Yeah. <laughs> right? They were su the superstars in their area. But sometimes it's, it's nice to see the other side of the coin or just someone who isn't in a megastar, somebody who's been around the game, a professional, but has a different type of story. Mm -hmm. It's not all about the success stories or the, the, the winning everything, and et cetera. It's that there are different parts of the game that these guys who are coming on at the moment, like Ravel we've just had on um, Saido, their stories help so many people, whether it's parents who are trying to get their kids into football and help them, or whether it's young players or players who are taking in their career now. Mm -hmm. There's bits that they can take from these guys that hopefully will put them in a better place to, to succeed and sustain a career. Do you think there's too much focus in football on everyone that makes it so people almost ignore those who don't or want to ignore those who don't? 
Yeah, yeah, because like that's what I mean, we were talking about in the, with Saido there, that is that you've had that badge on your chest for so many years and then it gets taken off at 13, 16, 18. These kids aren't prepped and built to deal with that negativity, with that, that loss. There's no badge no more. You're not at that, that level no more. You're not in the academy. You've been released. That is a big burden to take, man. That is a big, big lesson in life in terms of like, wow, I've got to go again. And I've got to take the embarrassment on the on the shoulders. I've got to take the pride being beaten, the ego now. People may be laughing and sniggering at me. Everyone I look at, I think they're talking about it. That is a big, heavy, heavy burden to carry, man. So it's no wonder you see some of these kids that can't deal with that. They need the help. I think mentoring to come out, what's come out of this talk today, I think mentoring in these academies is a huge part. And I think from what I hear and what I see, clubs are definitely focusing more on that. Do you see the story in the paper this last week about uh, Luke Giverin? Was it United? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw him at United. He was there when I was there. Yeah. He um, he won the Manchester Senior Cup, I think 2010, 2012, something like that. I remember watching that game um, at the Etihad. He now works in the Asda next door to the Etihad. How mm. that? Yeah, it's crazy. And I, it, it's, it's another story that's important. That's as an important story as talking about someone who's made it and goes to a World Cup or play Champions League football because his story is more common than all the others. His story is more common than the guy that makes it and you see in this in under the spotlight. He's the one that you're more likely going to be than not when you're budding out and starting out to become a professional footballer. So understand his story, Luke Givering's story. We should even put the link in the comments so people can yeah. see it because I think it's good for young people to see that this is like, this is, probably, this is the norm when you're yeah, sitting if you're out. an under-18s player, you're more likely to be Luke Givering, aren't you, than... Yeah. You know, than Pogba, for instance. Yeah, hundred percent. Guys, we've got to wrap up, we've got to go. Hope you're well. Really appreciate that, man. Listen, guys, this was Vibe with Fire. We had a fantastic time. What a talk. Great to speak to Sido. You guys as well, Steve and Joel. And I'll catch up with you next week, man. Hey right, guys, don't forget to let us know who you want next week in the comments. Yeah, who do you want, man? Who do you want us to get on? Tell us and we'll go and get them. Easy. All right, guys. Peace.